for those wonderful songs to remind us of what a blessing that we have 2,000 years later to be able to read the words of God and the, read about the examples of the early church as we're going to do tonight. Our scripture is taken from 2 Thessalonians, the first five verses of chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God and for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love that you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Good to see you all tonight. As we transition into the second letter from Paul to the church in Thessalonica. And what we learned in the first letter was that the folks in Thessalonica were getting it right. Paul referred to them as the model congregation. They were, in spite of the fact that they were a congregation that was made up of, of, of Jews and Gentiles, they left all of that to become one under the umbrella of, within, of Christ within the blood of Christ. And Paul was there for three weeks. A lot happened in three weeks in Thessalonica. He was there for three weeks. And then, you know what? You know what happened? What, what usually happens in the church when things are going really, really, really good? Something really, really bad comes along. Because Satan doesn't like it when the church is healthy. Satan doesn't like it when Christians are healthy and they're working together spiritually and they're expanding the kingdom. That's what was going on. And so things were happening and there were people who had a problem with it. And so there was a, an uproar, there were some, some rumors going around, and, and, and Paul left and went to Corinth for about 18 months. It was in that 18-month period that Paul wrote both letters to the church in Thessalonica. He wrote one letter that we've just completed, 1 Thessalonians, and he com commends them, as I've already stated, as the model church, talking about their faith and their hope and their love that they were exhibiting, that, that he could see happening there in that three-week period. And then he received a response back from them, a response that we have no record of. We don't know where the letter from the Thessalonians to Paul is. We've never seen it, never read it. However, as we begin our study of Paul's second letter, to the church in Thessalonica, we can get an idea of what they wrote him about and what their questions were and what their chief concern was. And that's what you see on the screen. They were concerned about the return of Jesus. They had questions about Jesus' return. Very important questions and one that we're going to take a look at this evening. But before we do that, let's, let's go to God in prayer together and ask the Spirit to bless the message tonight. 
Lord, thank You for bringing us back together tonight. It's always good to see those who have a desire to be together. Lord, we're so thankful for all the blessings that You've given to us as believers and as a congregation. And Lord, as we look at this message tonight, we, we see from Paul that, that the church in Thessalonica, even though it had its challenges, was a healthy congregation made up of healthy Christians. Doesn't mean that they didn't have their challenges. Doesn't mean that they came up short on some things. They did. They're human, as is every believer and every congregation of believers. Lord, I pray as we take a look and at this message tonight, what a healthy church looks like. Help us to be able to see that and to step back and take a look at ourselves and consider that question. What does a healthy church look like? Spirit, I pray that the message tonight is yours, that you will speak to us in a powerful way to help us to not only see what Paul is sharing with the Thessalonians, but what he's sharing with us. And may we take it to heart and apply it where we need to in our life and in our church family. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for all the blessings you give to us. And Lord, we offer this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What makes a congregation healthy? Think about that question. What makes a congregation healthy and how would a healthy church be defined? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. Everybody has a different idea. When you ask that question, different things come up in people's minds about the way that they would begin to answer that question. Some people would say, that a healthy congregation of believers is defined by the ministries and the programs that you offer. I mean, if you've got something going on, then you must be effective. If you have ministries and activities and things taking place and you're plugged into the community, then you must be a healthy congregation. Because if you don't, then you must be failing. Others define congregational health by the numbers. If you're packing the pews, then you're a healthy congregation. That's not always the truth. Let me ask you this. Picture this in your mind as an example. If you walk into a school cafeteria and you offer ice cream to any kid that wants one at this table, how many seats are going to be taken up at that table? Every last one. There's going to be standing room only around the ice cream table, right? But if you go to the table next to it and you offer spinach, all the spinach you can eat, how many seats are you going to fill? Not all of them. You're not going to fill all those seats. Ice cream table, standing room only. Spinach table, and you might have to fill half of those seats, if not more, and I'm being generous with that number. However, if you have a third table that offers steak and green beans and a baked potato and a dessert, there probably will be a crowd at that table that falls somewhere in the middle between the ice cream table and the spinach table. Because it offers a well-balanced, nutritional meal. Now, that's a very simplified illustration. It's very simple. But I believe that it's effective when it comes to what is offered and the numbers that respond. Still others feel that a congregation's health is determined by the offering plate, like we have up here and in the foyer. A church is a healthy church if there's a large contribution week in and week out. If that's the case, then a congregation has to be healthy, right? With more funding, you can hire a better minister. 
better staff, with more funding you can send out more missionaries to more places around the earth. With more funding you can have more programs and more activities and more involvement in the community. You can do all of those things and still have a heart of stone as a congregation. As Paul comes back to the church in Thessalonica in his second letter to them, it followed 1 Thessalonians, his first letter to them, by a matter of months, according to most scholars. And it's believed that Paul wrote both of these letters during an 18-month stay in Corinth around A.D. 52. So as we take a look this evening at the first five verses of this second letter, we're going to see some qualities. We're going to see some character qualities, some characteristics of what a, a healthy congregation looks like. But before we get into the text, we probably need to look at some background to give us a better picture of this congregation that Paul is referred to as the model congregation in Thessalonica. The city of Thessalonica is located in northern Greece, and during this time it was the capital city of the region of Macedonia. And today, it's not called Thessalonica today, it's called Thessaloniki. And Thessaloniki is the second most populated city in Greece, and it's located between Rome and Constantinople. The church in Thessalonica began, if you look in the book of Acts, the church in Thessalonica began during Paul's second missionary journey, and he was only there for three weeks. And as a result of his time there, many Jews and Greeks came together and obeyed the gospel and formed the congregation there in Thessalonica. And if you remember, the more stringent Jews, if you go back and look at it, the more stringent Jews stirred up rumors about Paul and Silas, and in order to avoid trouble, Paul and Silas left. They established the church, they saw that there was some resistance to it, and you know what, they had a choice to make. They could have fought back and stood up against it and repressed the rumors that were coming, but they came to the conclusion, you know what, we've established something here, the Lord is blessing it, let's step away from it. Let's avoid trouble. And sometimes that's the right decision to make. Sometimes that's the right path to take. During his 18-month stay in Corinth, Paul wrote his first letter addressing a number of issues in his three-week stay there. Chief among those issues was the idea that those who died physically before the return of Jesus would not go to heaven. This was a real fear that they had. Jesus is coming soon, but is He going to come soon enough? My, my mother or my father or my relative is, is, is lying sick. If, if they pass on before Jesus returns, does that mean that they won't go to heaven? That was a real fear and a real concern that they had. And Paul clearly assures them that all believers, all believers will be with the Lord when He returns. So not long after sending that first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul received a reply. Again, we have no record of it. We, we, we don't have a copy of that. We don't know what they said when they wrote back to him. We don't know what questions they asked when they wrote back to him. And keep in mind something very important. The distance between Corinth and Thessalonica was about 330 miles. Now, if you hop in your car, you're talking about maybe a six, seven hour drive, depending on the speed limit and whether you obey it or not. Okay? 330 miles is 330 miles. If you're walking or if you're riding a camel or riding a donkey, it's going to take you a while to get there. Okay? And so in the response Paul received, family, it became abundantly clear that some in the congregation there in Thessalonica believed that Jesus' return was imminent. 
I mean, when they said Jesus is coming soon, they took it very, very seriously. And so in preparation for that, they just shut down. They quit their jobs. They started packing things up. They were probably having their garage sales, you know, the, the return sale. Okay? They were getting ready for the return of Jesus and making preparations. Apparently they missed the point that you can't take anything with you. When you die, and you can't take anything with you when Jesus returns. So let's get into the text of the letter. In verses 1 to 5, Paul writes this. He says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is only fitting because your faith is increasing abundantly and the love of each and every one of you toward one another grows even greater. Man, what a great reputation to have. What a great thing to be known for as a congregation of believers. Paul goes on to say, as a result, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Not only were they loving one another and supporting one another, and again, people from opposite ends of the spectrum. The world today could take a, take a lesson from these people. Okay? We think our divisions are deep now. They were just as deep then. But yet they worked it all out because they were more dedicated to Christ and loving one another than the things that divided them. He says, we speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering. What's Paul saying? He's saying your suffering isn't for nothing. It's worth it. Just as he did in the first letter that he had written just a few months earlier, Paul begins by building them up. By telling them, hey, you, these are the things that you're doing right. In spite of all the bad things that are going on, he, he starts by building them up and complimenting them on their qualities as a healthy congregation. Now, if you know Paul and the way that he writes you know that this is not unusual. This is classic Paul. In Paul's writings, he generally wants to build you up or butter you up, depending on how you want to look at it. And then he tells you what he really needs you to know. You know, Mary Poppins was on to something. When she said just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. In effect, this is what Paul is doing. They're doing great things, and he's letting them know that they're doing great things, but there's some things that they need to work on. Paul begins by describing a healthy church. And he was motivated in planting and encouraging healthy churches. That's what Paul was all about. And Paul's words, though not comprehensive, family, are very insightful for us today. Again, we can learn a lot from this letter to the Thessalonians. Then we see Paul transition. He transitions in describing that which comprises a healthy congregation. And what is it that comprises a healthy congregation? Healthy Christians. Now notice how he defines a healthy Christian. First, he states that a healthy Christian is one who belongs to God. First and foremost, they belong to God. And this goes beyond the surface, family. I mean, as believers, don't we all belong to God? But here's the thing. Some Christians belong more to God than others. Some Christians belong to God 
in name only. But where Paul is going with this is to make the distinctive point that believers belong to God, true believers belong to God in a unique sense. We're not just as creation. I mean, if you think about it, everybody belongs to God in that sense. We're not just His unique creation, but we are a new creation. You and I as believers, we are a new creation in the blood of His Son. We have been justified and continually sanctified due to our rebirth by our immersion in the blood of Jesus. Second, he tells us that a healthy Christian is one who has received grace and peace. By definition, grace is an undeserved gift. And the reason why is because there's no way, there is absolutely no way that we can possibly live good enough for it, work hard enough for it, or do anything else to earn it. And when we make the choice to claim this undeserved gift, and that's a choice that we have. The gift has already been given. It's already been given. We have to decide whether we want to accept it or not. And when we make that choice to claim that undeserved gift of grace by dying to ourselves and submitting to the Lordship of Jesus through our death, burial, and resurrection, through our immersion we discover the peace that we've been looking for. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we celebrate in hope of the glory of God. Family, that word peace that Paul uses there is the Greek word irane. And it means to be joined as one. To be joined together as one in complete peace, in complete prosperity, in complete quietness, and in complete rest it means to be set as one in other words it means to be healed when we have the peace of God when we've received the peace of God through our confession and our baptism our immersion into Christ when we receive the peace of God we are healed and it means that we've hit the reset button in our life This is what it means to be a healthy Christian. And a healthy congregation is comprised, it's made up of healthy Christians. So what's the evidence? What is the evidence of a healthy church? A healthy congregation family is evidenced by a number of things. First, a healthy congregation is one that is growing in its relationships. Primarily in our relationship with the Lord, that's the top priority, isn't it? That's the top relationship. But it's more than that. It's about our relationships with one another and with the community around us. Remember, we are ambassadors of Christ, aren't we? It's more than just what we just do in here. It's about taking what we gain in here and in our relationships with God and with one another, and we take it out to the world around us that's starving for it. That's hurting for it. And so relationships are, impo- are, 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 are important and they are a sign of a healthy congregation and a healthy Christian. And here's the thing. Relationships are like any other living thing. They grow because we give them the attention that they need. And so what does that look like? What does that look like? It means that we spend time together. That goes beyond staring at the back of somebody's head in front of you in this room. 
It's got to be more than that. It means that we have conversations with one another. Man, that's why I hate to come up here and bust up the fellowship before services start. Because that's good stuff. That's relationships happening. That's building relationships. That's, that's building our love and our bonds for one another. And the only thing that really supersedes that is that we need to stop for a minute and we need to worship the Lord. Relationships are, impo- are, are, are important. It means that we work out our problems. It means that we make the effort to stay connected. It means that we try as hard as we can to avoid growing apart because of a disagreement or because of a difference of opinion. Think about all the congregations that you've heard of that have split over something. And you go back and you ask those people that were a part of it, was it worth it? In some cases it was. Because Scripture was compromised. Those are rare. Most of the congregations that split and go their separate ways are over things that aren't going to amount to a hill of beans when this life is over. I've heard of a church splitting because the parking lot was striped this way instead of that way. I've heard of a congregation that split because the carpet was the wrong color. People are fickle. They're very fickle. And the reason why people, Christian people, are fickle is because God is not the top priority in their life. It's important that we make the effort in our relationships It means making the effort to come to consensus. But that is impossible and insincere without full disclosure of the facts. Without full disclosure of our feelings. Without full disclosure of our motives. We have to be honest with one another. In this second letter to the Thessalonian church, Paul gives three gauges highlighting the good spiritual health of a congregation. The first is a growing faith. And this is something that can't be ignored, family. A church that has a growing faith is a church that has a visible faith. We don't just talk about it, we live it. We don't just have conversations about it, it shows in the life that we live as individuals, and as a congregation collectively. And it's visible in our attitude, it's visible uh, in our actions, it is the molder and the shaper of transformed lives. And we plant the seed of faith, we're called to do that, you and I are. We plant the seed of faith by sharing the gospel, somebody else waters that seed by teaching, by encouraging, by loving, by lifting them up, by setting a good example to follow. But it's the Lord who ultimately gives the increase. However, church, as individual Christians, there's some tools available to us to assist in a growing faith and to become a healthy Christian and a healthy church. The first tool is the Word of God. Family, the Bible that we hold in our hand is direct communication to us about how to grow our faith and about how to live a strong and healthy spiritual life. Second, a healthy Christian and a healthy congregation have a growing prayer life. You see, they go hand in hand. The Word is God's communication to you and me. And we're only going to know what God wants us to know if we share time in conversation with Him, Him conversing with us through His Word. Prayer goes hand in hand with that. Prayer is our communication to God. And what we share with Him. It's not like He doesn't already know. He knows. 
But it's kind of like you hear people say, well, you know, so-and-so doesn't have to tell me that they love me. I know it. You know what? There ain't a person in this world that doesn't want to hear somebody tell them that they love them, even if they already know it. Right? And so prayer gives us that opportunity to do so, to converse with God. He converses through His Word. We converse with Him through prayer. And here's the thing. Most believers agree. They agree that prayer is important and they agree that it's valuable. But here's the deal. They don't utilize it in accordance with the importance and value that they ascribe to it. Oh, it's important to me, but I don't use it like I should. Really? Then maybe we should. It's said that the early converts of Christianity on the African continent were earnest and regular in their prayer life. And each one reportedly had their spot that they would go to in the thicket to pray. And so over the course of time, each person would wear a path to their spot where they go and pray. And here's the thing, when, when, when someone was lacking in their prayer life, it was abundantly clear to everybody else. Because the path to their prayer spot was beginning to grow grass. It wasn't as worn as it used to be. And if one of these believers began to neglect prayer, it was soon apparent to everyone. And when everybody was aware of it, they would kindly remind the negligent one, Brother, the grass grows on your path. Church, wouldn't it be great if it was that obvious. Maybe it is. Maybe it is that obvious. And either we don't realize it, or more than likely, we're just too afraid to acknowledge it. So how does the grass grow on the path of a believer today? Well, most obviously, their path to the pew is not as well-worn as it used to be. Take a look around. Are there people not here tonight that used to be that haven't gone on to be with the Lord? Were there people here this morning who used to be here regularly, but they're not anymore? Is it possible that grass is grown in their path to the pew. Also, if we will pay attention, we'll see grass growing in our brother and sister's attitudes and actions. How? Their involvement in the church isn't what it used to be. Their example isn't what it used to be. Their relationship with their spouse and their family isn't what it ought to be. You see, we can see that. But what are we willing to do about it? We can see that. But are we willing to step out in love and faith and say, brother, sister, grass grows on your path. Family, if our prayer life is what it ought to be, then these weeds in our prayer life and in our service life within the church and our Christianity would not appear. And you know why? Because the path would be trampled by our knees bending in prayer. Third, healthy Christians and healthy congregations utilize the benefits of the church. Do we have any idea how blessed we are to have all of the benefits of being the church? The church is the petri dish of the Christian faith. When you stop and think about it, the congregation is the proving ground. The proving ground where we put our love and our compassion 
in our forgiveness, in our prayer, in our praise, in our service and commitment into practice. To encourage one another, but also to be a witness and a light to the world around us. And this must happen across all lines. There can be no barriers that stop us. Again, this is something that the Thessalonian church got right. We can't allow anything to stop us. Family, this is something that must happen across all lines that divide other people. Lines such as age, race, gender, politics, socioeconomics, culture education, and other lines that divide people. Family, the church at Thessalonica figured that out, for the most part. They were a congregation of Jews and Gentiles united together as one in the blood of Jesus. Now, does that mean that they didn't have their issues? Absolutely not. They had their problems. And just like most congregations today, the issues that they had were stirred up by outliers on either end of the spectrum. There's always going to be somebody who has a problem with the church, that has a problem with Jesus, that has a problem with believers doing what we've been called to do. And that's where leadership has to step up. And dedicated believers have to fall in line behind them. Calling it for what it is. Whenever something raises its ugly head, leadership has to take the lead. And faithful believers have to fall in line behind them and shut it down sooner rather than later. And regardless, all things must be done in a spirit of love and in the best interests of the congregation as a whole. And this is what a healthy congregation does. When it's guided by a healthy leadership and healthy Christians working together, it sees the big picture. And as a result of their love for one another and a love for what is right, the world around them clearly sees that and is attracted to it. You know, I mentioned something this morning. I mentioned that <clears throat> the, the mansion of the high priest was 13,000 square feet. That's a big place. Did you know that Joel Osteen's house in Houston is 17,000 square feet? People are not dumb. People can see when somebody is serving the Lord out of the Lord's interests and the people's interests and when they're serving out of their own interests. And so it's important for us to serve one another as we serve Christ. That's what Paul is talking about to the church in Thessalonica, and they were getting it right. Let me ask you a question. Does what I've spoken of tonight describe the Mesquite Church of Christ? If Paul were here among us to write a letter to us, would he commend our faith, our love, our endurance, and our commitment to doing what is right. What kind of spiritual checkup would we receive? Would he declare us to be a healthy congregation? And would he declare you and me to be healthy Christians? Or would he tell any of us or us as a congregation, the grass grows on your path. Let me ask you a question as we close. How's your path this evening? Is there grass growing in your path because you haven't been making your way to the Lord as much as you should? And don't feel like you're the only one that's ever had to deal with that or is dealing with that by yourself. You're not. We've all been there at different times. Sometimes life happens. And sometimes life happens in, in ways and on days that are very, very difficult for us to deal with. 
Things get in the way. We don't, we don't tread that path to the Lord as much as we should in prayer. Maybe there's something going on in your life tonight that you need us to pray with you and pray for you about. How's your path? Is the grasp of frustration or financial problems or relational problems or whatever growing in your path that you need to get rid of? Let us pray with you and pray for you. If you need to confess Jesus as Lord tonight and die to yourself in baptism to live a new life just as Jesus intended for you to by going to the cross for you, everything's ready for you. Whatever you need tonight, let's respond as the Spirit calls us while we stand.